I did a project for Barclays Bank in England. I was a new consultant. I was 33 years old, had a new, nice new suit and a nice red tie, nice briefcase. And we went and we wrote a report. We charged them 1.6 million pounds, $2 million for our reports. Big report, it's like nine months work. And we talked to everybody in the business with this report. The business unit heads, the board, the chairman, the chief executive, all the stakeholders, all the PowerPoint slides, all the engagement, all the enthusiasm, all the inspiration in the world. Nothing happened with that report. Nothing happened. They did nothing. It's not that they didn't like it. It's not that they didn't agree. They paid the fee of $2 million, but nothing happened. No change happened. So I thought to myself, I was a young idealistic consultant like many of you sitting in the audience to think, when are they going to blow the whistle on us? Are we really going to end up not in jail for charging these guys $2 million for telling them what to do and then walking away and saying, good luck with that. Hope it works out for you. Now, ask anybody who's worked on projects for a long time, especially projects that have gone badly, you'll say, what went wrong? And they say, we didn't change behaviors. It's just kind of a stupid thing to say, right? How can you have a project without changing behaviors? How can you have a system that the users don't use? Right? Well, we got the system in. Nobody uses it. I mean, you say that, we joke about it now, but we had a knowledge management system at PricewaterhouseCoopers in the 1990s. Nobody used it. Nobody used it because it required consultants to put in their proposals and their project plans and their post-project evaluations and their project documentation. They actually had to do the work to upload it into the system, otherwise the system would be useless. But we didn't want to change our behavior. When the project was over, we wanted to go on to the next thing or go home to see our wives and children. So behaviors didn't change, no one used the system. And with something like a knowledge management system, if nothing goes into it, nothing comes out of it. Models such as Cotter's from Harvard are positively harmful if you try and apply them in today's businesses the way they're run today with today's business challenges. And so, this is the big gap between what goes in up here our ideas, our dreams, our goals, our aspirations, our plans, and our actions, our behaviors. This is a problem that's at the root of human happiness, it's at the root of prosperous societies, and it's at the root of business success, is how do you line up that which is here with hands and behaviors? Does that make sense? To some extent? And I'll tell you what, we're really bad at it. So here's a quiz. What percentage of heart attack victims change their diet, exercise, and smoking behaviors? Come on. 30. What do we see here? 30. 30. We have a 30. Higher? Lower? 20. 20. We have a 30 and 20. You guys are very generous to your fellow human beings. You know that. <laughs> You're being very too kind. Anybody have another answer? There's much lower. There's 7%. Now, our own model of changes, if it's rational, it's a good idea, you can make a case for it, and it's emotional, what are called two sides of the brain, it's a metaphor, it's not accurate, but whatever, you should want to change, right? So what's more emotional and more rational, you know, having a heart attack? You've got pretty good reasons, rationally, and you just about left your loved ones behind. It's pretty emotional. 7% behavioral change? Wow. That's pretty weird, right? So something's wrong with our model, for sure, because it doesn't explain that. Culture change exceeds about 19% of the time. 19% of the time. How often have you heard or read in a management book or heard a CEO talk about, we have to change the culture? <laughs> like, oh my God, okay, here we go again, right? <laughs> yeah, almost never succeeds, 20% of the time. Yeah, but yet it's like a, a something that you hear people say all the time, right? We have to change the culture. We have to get the culture right. We need this kind of culture. We need a data science culture. So, very interesting. So, why does this happen? And here's the model that is underlying all of these change models that I showed you on the earlier slide. Is there's a two-step model of how we change behaviors. Step one change hearts and minds. So you inspire people, you educate them, you convince them, you persuade them, you inspire. What are some other good words for it? You change what's inside here, right? And then, 
this is where the miracle happens. Behaviors follow. So how easy is it to change someone's mind? Hearts and mind. That's not that easy to begin with, right? In fact, there's something called the backfire effect. You'll love this, right? A professor of public policy in American University. The backfire effect. If you provide someone who's a climate science denier with facts, it strengthens their opposition to climate science, right? And this happens all over. It happens in politics and it happens all over. Provision of facts strengthens their opposition if they're ideologically committed. It's called motivated reasoning. Yeah, it's not really reasoning at all. So reasoning in inverted commas. So it's not very easy to do this, but all over in our education system and in the way we run businesses and in the way we run society, we assume that if you change what's inside between the ears, it will manifest itself and change in the real world. Doesn't happen, it's a fantasy. Very few people have thought about how cognitive biases affect decision-making in business. If you think about it, it's kind of strange, right? There's a collection of people that are making strategy decisions and operational decisions and marketing decisions and, you know, they're making decisions all the time. Very little work has been done on how cognitive biases skew those in stupid direction. Defaults, what are the default settings? For example, in Denmark, you have an atrocious rate of organ donation. 7%, apparently. I'll show you a slide in a minute. In Austria, it's 90%. You know why? Why do you think? Are you more stingy with your organs than Austria? Because it's default that they are. Yeah, bingo. Head of the class. Here, you have to say, and in the United States, by the way, you have to say, go on, take my kidneys and my liver. Yeah? You have to check, opt in. In Austria, you have to opt out. No, 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 I don't want, I don't want anyone touching my kidneys when I'm dead. <laughs> you have to actually say that. So, but if you think about how simple that changes, and this is the amazing thing about behavioral science, is that little tiny change from opt-in to opt-out produces a swing from about 7% in Denmark to about 90% in Austria. We have, in the behavioral science, something called the feast. Fun, easy, attractive, social, and timely. Let me show you some examples. Timely. So you can lecture people till they're blue in the face about how they should walk up two stairs and down one or down two and up one or something like that. Which is more effective, that? Yeah? That's funny, right? It's good. This is something that's of concern. Mostly I say to women in the audience as well. Um, is if you ever lived with men, you know that uh, accuracy can be a trouble. This is another example of a nudge. How does this work? I don't know. It almost certainly would have saved five or six of my relationships in at least one marriage. So we can't leave behavioral science without talking about habits, those horrible things, hard to change, it's hard to get good ones, and God knows we all have enough bad ones, right? So let's talk about one of the misconceptions about habits, that they're about motivation. Okay, so get that out of your mind. Motivation is not your friend. When you, motivation is a function of physical arousal. You wake up some mornings, right? You don't feel it. You had a bad night's sleep, you're tired, you have jet lag. Your motivation is a function of that arousal, right? Clearly, right? It's physiolog physiological. And it's also a function of the narrative of the story that you're telling yourself. But your motivation can be like this, right? You have days when you feel really motivated and days where you don't. Right? Yeah. So I used to live in a place in America, it's kind of a Scandinavian place, Wisconsin, a lot of Danes and Swedes and so forth there. And you see people out running when it's 25, minus 25 degrees. They're out running. And I used to think to myself, what are they thinking? How do they motivate themselves? They don't. They don't. It's a habit. They don't. Every time, they're going to go out running, look out the window and go, I wonder what the weather is. Oh, minus 25. Oh, oh, you know, they don't have that debate with themselves about their motivation. They get their shoes on and they go out and run. And that's the way habits work, is they sit on top of motivation. So let's talk about some habits. Meditation, right? How many people think I should probably meditate? 
Okay, that's one of you. Okay, so <laughs> you all need to read more. But um, anyway, so uh, of all of the things you can read in the psychology section of the self-help section of your bookstores, you have that in Denmark too? You have it in California, right? You have a self-help uh, self bookstore in California the size of this room. <laughs> and God knows they need it. But um, so of all the things you can do, meditation is the one that reduces stress, it reduces mental illness, it reduces... Um, Emotion control, impulsivity, decision-making, creativity, blah, blah, blah. This is all research-based, right? So all that shit that you see in the self-help section, you can set that on fire and basically start meditating.